of house building with some of the schemes and we are looking at ways where the Scottish Government can assist further uh, for the rural and island communities. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements is planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. Presiding Officer, we have just voted in a budget of scarce resources. Every pound, every penny should be accounted for and explained. The First Minister's trip to the Ryder Cup cost in excess of £468,000. Visit Scotland has accounted for how it spent £414,000 of that total. But, despite a series of freedom of information requests and missed deadlines, the Scottish Government has failed to account for £54,000 of that total. Could the First Minister please account for that spending now? First Minister. <laughs> well, uh, uh, actually, in terms of Joanne Lambert's question, she just passed the answer to her own question. It wasn't actually the 460,000. The Scottish Government spend was 50,000 uh, pounds, not the 460,000. Uh, uh, the freedom of information question will be answered uh, as soon as possible. But can I just? <laughs> well, uh, as indeed it will. Uh, and and why shouldn't it be? Uh, because in my mind. The spending on the trip to Chicago, the investment decisions that brought jobs to Scotland, uh, the uh, variety of activities which promoted our country, uh, the huge importance of the £100 million of estimated benefit from having the Ryder Cup uh, in our country, all that justifies a substantial effort to promote this country. And I honestly say to Jan Lambert, as we go into this uh, into this year of the, the Commonwealth Games, of homecoming, of the Ryder Cup, as the attention of the world is centred on Scotland. Can't we just agree that it is the duty and obligation of the Scottish Government and every public authority in Scotland to maximise the benefit from that particular... Joanne Lamont. Order. A million pounds of taxpayers' cash spent on a record 14 special advisers, and still the First Minister can't come up with an answer to a simple question. My mother used to say, every penny should be a prisoner because it came from the sweat of your father's brow. He, the First Minister, should be as cautious with public spending and the public purse too. It is entirely reasonable to ask what has happened to that £54,000. Visit Scotland has admitted to spending almost £1,000 for a pianist, more than £1,100 flying in chefs from Glen Eagles, and more than £1,700 on ties. It has been reported that the First Minister chose not to stay in the hotel the rest of the delegation stayed in, but instead stayed in the more exclusive Peninsula Hotel further away from the course. Suites at that hotel cost more than $2,000 a night. Can the First Minister confirm that he stayed in that hotel, explain why he wanted to stay in a more upmarket hotel than the rest of the delegation, and what it cost? First Minister. First Minister. Uh, on, uh, First Minister. There were 17 uh, people in the uh, Scottish Government delegation. That was a, a range of officials from uh, Scottish Enterprise, from the, the Scottish Government's Industry Department. It, uh, uh, can I just correct Joanne Lamont that the visit was not just about the two days of the Ryder Cup. Uh, the visit stretched over the range of events uh, in Chicago to attract investment to Scotland. The investment to Scotland that was announced in that trip was worth tens of millions of pounds and brought jobs to many areas of Scotland. Uh, can I just say to Jan Lamont, she mentioned the figure of a million pounds. I should say in terms of special advisers, uh, our record of special advisers is incomparably better in terms of spending than the, uh, yes. than the previous Labour Liberal Administration. But again, on memory, and I, I'm open to a uh, correction on this, I, I think the number of special advisers for the, the Scottish Government, for the whole of our Government, uh, I think is actually less than the individual special advisers for the Deputy Prime Minister uh, oh. at, the, uh, at the present moment. And in terms of a million pound, that million pound figure sticks in my memory because I, I think that was the expenditure in Scotland Week uh, from Jack McConnell's administration. 
Uh, and I think, you know, that could well have been justified. Yep. It's so interesting, however, that we've managed to bring as many jobs in rightfully promoting Scotland and the United States without ever hitting that million pound figure, part of an administration which, of course, in which Joanne Lamont was a minister. So why don't we, pick, why don't we focus on the issue of how we promote this country, of getting the advantage of promoting Scotland on the world stage, of embracing the year 2014 as being a great year to Scotland, and just say that that promotion, whether it's by Visit Scotland or by the Scottish Government, is of immense value in bringing jobs and livelihoods to the people of Scotland. Joanne Lamont. It is, possible, it is possible to do all of that this year and answer simple questions about the money that you have spent. It is possible to do both things. And I have to say, that answer, that answer plums the depths of finding anything to talk about, anything to talk about except a simple question about a hotel bill. £54,000 is more than twice what the average person earns in a year. Yet the First Minister cannot account for how he spent that much money in just a week. When the Daily Telegraph asked for the Scottish Government to account... <coughs> Order! 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 Mr Wheelhouse! Order. I'm not sure if we've quite got to the point yet where journalists are not allowed to ask questions. But if we are, we are in a very serious place. So when the Daily Telegraph asked for the Scottish Government to account for the whole half million pounds spent in the Ryder Cup, they said, they said at first that they couldn't. They then said they did. Then Visit Scotland accounted for what it spent. Then the government told the Telegraph they would give details on the 10th of January. Now, two weeks after that deadline and two months after Visit Scotland responded, the First Minister still cannot give an answer. I ask him again, how did he spend his cut of the half million pounds spent on a trip to the Gulf? First Minister, order, First Minister. What Joanne Lamont said about plumbing the depths. I, I, think, I, I, think, I, I know that uh, the Daily Telegraph is becoming the House Journal of the Labour Party in Scotland. <laughs> but can, can I just, uh, for the third time, let's correct a few things. The half million thing is obviously uh, not the case because, as she rightly says, Visit Scotland didn't admit. Uh, they spelt out yeah. what they'd spent in terms of promotion of this country. Uh, and in terms of the promotion of Scotland in the Ryder Cup, that is an important aspect of what we have to do to realise the estimated £100 million pounds of, of benefit. And for those, in terms of defending Visit Scotland, I mean, just one aspect of what was done, there was a, a film showed that... Uh, uh, at the Ryder Cup was shown to the live uh, television audience of many hundreds of millions promoting Scotland as a tourist destination. Uh, Joanne Lambert should just consider what would have happened if they'd had to visit Scotland and had to buy that sort of publicity. Yeah. I've also pointed out that when we get to the Scottish Government spend, it ain't me that's spending it. It's 17 people in the Scottish Government delegation. Uh, a range of investments were announced while we were in Chicago in terms of generating jobs and investment. It's one of the reasons, incidentally, why FDI projects, that is foreign direct investment projects into Scotland, are up 49% in the most recent figures, just as the Better Together campaign were predicting a collapse. So why don't we keep our eye on how we can promote our country? and celebrate the promotion and the opportunities we have this year and how many jobs we can generate for the people of Scotland. And since I've put the onus on jobs and employment, maybe for once in First Minister's questions, perhaps not in light of the job figures yesterday, Joanne Lamont will get round to asking me about the economy, about unemployment, yeah. about generating yeah. jobs for the people of Scotland. Joanne Lamont. You know, Order, I, Joanne Lamont. I welcome the unemployment figures. I genuinely do. I just want an explanation of these figures, of what the government has spent £54,000. The First Minister still has not explained it. He talks about Visit Scotland. Visit Scotland has done their job. They've explained how they spent their money. We ask them to follow their example. 
Because we know the First Minister went to extraordinary lengths to stop the public finding out he spent £250 of their money on a pair of Chinese checked trousers when he forgot his tartan trues. But this is more serious. What do we know? The First Minister spent half a million pounds on a trip to the Ryder Cup. The First Minister reportedly upgraded himself at our expense to stay in a hotel frequented by Beyonce, Brad Pitt and Justin Bieber. And if you don't know, and if you don't know the peninsula of Chicago, if you don't know the peninsula, well, this is a question, Penins the peninsula of Chicago is for those who love to spoil themselves yeah. with a luxurious, a luxurious five-star experience without losing that comfortable home away from home feeling. So the First Minister has to explain where he spent that money because he should understand this that in the real world, the people of Scotland will be disgusted at how the First Minister treats himself at their expense. Can he now have at least the decency of explaining to them, explaining to them how he spent in just one week the £54,000 of taxpayers' money, which he still hasn't accounted for? First Minister. There were in my memory, 17 people in the Scottish Government a, 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 a delegation. That is the expenditure uh, of £50,000 in that uh, delegation. That is in terms of the flights and the accommodation for 17 people. Now, I, I think this is an improvement, actually, because the last time Joanne Lamont uh, mentioned this uh, issue. She I was going to have me spending the entire £500,000. So I, I should actually be eternally grateful. We've now boiled that down to £50,000. But I could ask her to go one step further and just to accept there were actually 17 people in the yeah. Scottish Government delegation. Yeah. But more importantly, can we accept the key announcements that were made for jobs yeah. across Scotland, the key promotion that were made for many Scottish companies, the oil and gas roundtable discussion, which also has resulted in jobs coming to Scotland, the great promotion of our country, and not just the Scottish Government's efforts over that week, but Visit Scotland's efforts at the Ryder Cup itself. I was proud to note that on the television coverage, the saltire flew so prominently at the Ryder Cup in Chicago, because that's an essential part of preparing for the great success we're going to have in Glen Eagles. I am proud of the work that Visit Scotland does in terms of the increase in Scottish tourism, what we're now seeing. I'm proud of the work that SDI does in bringing jobs to Scotland. You see, that's one of the reasons why we've had a record increase in employment in Scotland and why unemployment in Scotland is 6.4%. And the reason that this government is in office is because we focus on the things that matter to the people of Scotland. Yeah. That's jobs and growth, not to this ridiculous frippery we get from Joanne Lamont. Question number two, Mr Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Prime Minister. Uh, Minister. No plans uh, near future. Ruth Davidson. A new report from the Scottish Funding Council has revealed that the number of students studying in Scotland's colleges has plummeted by 140,000 over the past five years. That's a cut of more than a third in college places since the SNP came to power. Can the First Minister tell me how many women have been affected? First Minister. Can, can, can I dispute uh, the figures that Ruth Davison is using? The, the correct way to look at teaching at Scottish colleges is to concentrate on full-time equivalent places. And that, well, why that is important is that tells you the level of teaching that is taking place in Scotland's colleges. If you do not do that, then you equate what could be a course of two or three hours with an HNC or an HND, and clearly that is ridiculous. Now, the Scottish Government have kept our commitment of maintaining the full-time equivalent places at the level we spelt out in our manifesto. Full-time equivalents in 2012-13 were 116 
1,399. That is the funded places, and that shows we have kept to the manifesto commitment. And Scotland's colleges, which are being uh, renewed and invested in across the country at the present moment, let us remember that you look at the budget for Scotland's colleges, which, yes, has come under pressure, but the pay of bail and the budget for Scotland's colleges is incomparably better than what is happening south of the border. And before she says that is irrelevant, <clears throat> let us remember that even Ruth Davidson knows that our budget in Scotland is governed by consequentials. So when I can demonstrate, as I will if she asks me again, how the funding position for Scotland's colleges, certainly under pressure, is incomparably better than yeah. south of the border, then unless she can detail where exactly we are going to get Scotland's funding from, then her question is nullified by practice south of the border. Of course, she could change her mind on independence, she could redraw a line in the sand, and then we can use Scotland's resources to get even more success from our colleges and universities. Ruth Davidson. Do you know the most telling thing about that answer was that I asked the First Minister about women and he, forgot about and he ignored them. Well, I can tell the First Minister that the number of women studying in part-time courses has been slashed. There are now 80,000 fewer women studying part-time in Scotland's colleges than the day that he took office. Now, the First Minister says that he wants more women in Scotland back in the workplace, and I agree with him. But childcare is only part of the issue. For a woman who's had a family, possibly a career break, and who wants to get back into the workplace, a part-time course allows her to juggle childcare and find a route back in. Mike Russell has flippantly dismissed part-time courses as hobby courses in this chamber before. So what has the First Minister got to say to the 80,000 women who can't get a college place now? First Minister. <coughs> The reason I answered Ruth Davidson as I did, I was collecting the, uh, correcting the premise of, of the question. The key measure is full-time equivalent places, and that is crucially important. Ruth Davidson says, how are we going to get women back into the workplace? Uh, yes, it is hugely important and a concern of this government. Has she not noticed the unemployment and employment figures yesterday, which indicate there is a rise of 62,000 women who have come back into the workplace over the year to November. It's not just what we're going to do in future, which is going to get an even greater rise, but what's happened over the last year. I heard Gray saying he thought many of the jobs were part-time. We actually know from the statistics that these are full-time positions. Full-time positions created in the employment figures at 62,000. That's 3% rise of women in the workforce. Given we know from the statistics that women are doing better than men in terms of the qualifications from school. They're going into better, yeah. uh, better uh, destinations in terms of the school figures. And we know from the statistics that the number of women are rising quickly in the workforce at 62,000. Then this government can claim not just to be offering the prospect of free and, ca and a comprehensive childcare in independent Scotland, but already succeeding yeah. in bringing women back into the workforce. And that is partly because, of course, that the colleges are now concentrating on courses which equip people yes. and give them the training and the exactly. skills required yes. Yes. to get into the workforce in a successful way. And one final point. I know that Ruth Davidson, with this acute interest she got in these things, will have noticed the rising number of women in apprenticeships, modern apprenticeships in Scotland, in a rise in apprenticeships, which has gone up by 60 per cent. All round, not a bad position, given the restraints of her colleagues in London and the Westminster straitjacket that this government has been in. Question three, Will Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, issues are of importance uh, to the people of Scotland. Will Rennie. Police stop and search in Scotland has increased fourfold since he came to power. Three quarters of a million people in the last year alone. Most were conducted without any suspicion of a crime. The vast majority were young people, 500 under the age of 10. I find it difficult to understand how children under 10 are in any position to give the police consent to search. Is he comfortable treating very young children like this? First Minister. Well, what I am comfortable with is that 70 per cent of the stop and searches were consensual in terms of the regulations that are put forward. I am comfortable with the fact uh, that, uh, as Police Scotland has indicated, 
uh, that many of these stop and searches uh, achieved the required uh, result in terms of uh, finding uh, potentially offensive weapons or other aspects of, of behaviour. And the thing I'm most satisfied with, and I think Willie Rennie should dwell for a minute, uh, is the sharp reduction in offensive uh, weapon carrying and also in the crime uh, against persons in terms of knife crime and other serious crime. Uh, and I, I do think that uh, Willie Rennie, when he asks these things, uh, should have a look at the results we're achieving in terms of violent crime in Scotland, because one of the things we encountered and had to square up to when this government took office was the serious problem of knife crime and victims across Scotland calling for action. When the police have initiated successful action in the way they've done, I think at some point the Liberal Democrats should say, well, look, perhaps there is some sense and logic into the police forces of Scotland and now the Scotland's police in terms of how they're carrying forward the responsibilities. Well, then, if it's so clear, I presume he's planning a further fourfold increase in stop and search. I am genuinely disappointed that the First Minister is so blasé about this encroaching police tactic without checks and balances. Listen to the Children's Commissioner. He said this was, there needs to be appropriate safeguards. The Human Rights Commissioner says it is largely unregulated and unaccountable. I think 750,000 people being stopped and searched, 80% getting no result, and so many young children being targeted is something the First Minister should be concerned about. He risks alienation of a generation. Isn't it time the First Minister sanctioned an overhaul of police stop and search? First Minister. Well, I, I, I think uh, in terms of what Willie Rennie believes about alienation of the public, you should have a look at the, the figures which show that people's fear of crime in Scotland is uh, not just reducing but substantially lower uh, than elsewhere uh, in these islands. I don't accept for a second that we are complacent or blasé about these matters. You'll know that the Scottish Police Authority at its board meeting uh, last August uh, discussed the report from Police Scotland entitled Keeping People Safe from Stop and Search. The board instructed the authorities' performance and working group to undertake a detailed scrutiny of the issue uh, and report back long before uh, Willie Rennie asked his question. Uh, Chief Constable Sir Stephen House, uh, speaking uh, last October uh, to the Justice Subcommittee of this Parliament, we stress to our officers that first they must do stop and search with integrity, fairness and respect. They have to have a reason for doing it. They have to treat people fairly while they do it. Now, these things are being examined by the Parliament and the Police uh, Authority. There's no indication of any complacency whatsoever. But I think we should uh, reflect just for a second that crime in Scotland is at a 39-year low. Violent crime is down by almost a half since 2006-07. Homicides are at their lowest level since records began, and that is because of two things. One, that we trust our police officers to carry forward the responsibilities uh, in an effective way. And secondly, of course, we have a thousand more police officers in the streets and communities of Scotland carrying that work, out that work on behalf of the Scottish people. Question number four, Jamidi. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to findings from the universities of Edinburgh and Oxford that the Pentland Firth could provide enough renewable energy to power approximately half of Scotland's homes. First Minister. Well, I welcome the work by the universities of Edinburgh, Oxford, Western Australia, which builds on the research of last year and provides a valuable insight on how best uh, to exploit this tremendous resource to, to meet Scotland's electricity needs. In September last year, we consented the first tidal array in the Pentland Firth the largest of its kind to be awarded consent in Europe. This initial array by developer Magen will provide valuable learning for the research community and the wider tidal energy industry, as well as being a substantial uh, array uh, and development of tidal power. Thank the First Can Minister for that answer. Will he join with me in paying tribute to the contribution made by the engineers at the universities of Edinburgh and Oxford? The most detailed study yet of how much tidal power could be generated by turbines placed in the Pentland Firth between mainland Scotland and Orkney. But what more can be done to overcome the barriers to investment created by the UK Government's handling of electricity market reform to create jobs in manufacturing and across the supply chain so that we can power our economy and allow Scotland to realise its potential as a world leader in renewable and tidal energy? First Minister. 
Well, I do congratulate the researchers. Their estimate of 1.9 gigawatts is an informed insight and, and provided a, also expertise into location of tidal turbines. Uh, Scotland leads the world in wave and tidal technologies. That is why we established uh, the Saltire Prize, the European Marine Energy Centre Nortney. Uh, it was the first and uh, the only centre of its kind in the world to provide wave and tidal tech developers with accredited and grid-connected testing facilities. There is no doubt uh, the electricity market reform, the uncertainties created by the United Kingdom Government have dealt severe blows to offshore renewable prospects in Scotland. Uh, and I do say that given when we know that between the offshore and the tidal and the wave power uh, and offshore wind and the onshore power in the islands of Scotland, not only Shetland, the Western Isles have the potential, it is estimated to contribute 5 per cent uh, of GB electricity by 2030, that we should not lose sight of this amazing potential clean green opportunity that, that Scotland's geography uh, offers to us, uh, and wave and tidal power, in the opinion of the Scottish Government, are very much part of that picture. Ian Gray. Uh, thank you, President Officer. 1.9 gigawatts of potential in the Pentland Firth is impressive enough, although the technological challenges remain significant. However, in 2008, the First Minister confidently told the world of the Pentland Firth. The sort of power that potentially could come from this area is not some hundreds of megawatts. It's not just like one conventional power station. It's 20 gigawatts. And more than that, that's like 20 conventional power stations. When will the First Minister realise that Scotland's renewables potential will in the end be delivered by serious science and not by hysterical hyperbole? First Minister. Well, uh, firstly, the, the, est the estimate from Edinburgh and Oxford is that real estate is 1.9 gigawatts uh, from tidal arrays. Uh, the estimate we had from, uh, uh, from uh, the Welsh University in 2008 was the total potential of, of offshore power uh, in Scotland. The Pentland Firth is one of the, uh, uh, the foremost areas and locations for tidal power. Uh, we're looking at already a tidal project deploying, which is going to produce many megawatts of power. This is important research. Uh, I think two things. One is Ian Gray should just get on board. The biggest obstacle to the development of marine resources in Scotland is currently the uncertainty being generated by the UK Government. Yeah. Uh, and the biggest asset uh, in terms of developing this undoubted potential is the enthusiasm and expertise of our scientists and the solid, consistent, enthusiastic support of the Scottish Government. Yeah. All that the Labour Party would get on board uh, as opposed uh, to trying to undermine the yeah. industry uh, in terms of uh, yeah. Ian Gray's normal performance. Question five, Sarah Boyer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to strengthen the powers that local authorities and communities have to purchase land. First well, the Scottish Government wants to see one million acres of land in community ownership by 2020. Uh, most recently, I was delighted uh, that the 10-year campaign to, uh, uh, to purchase the state on Lewis was secured by the community after a funding package was put in place to our local residents to buy the 26,775-acre estate. In support of that ambition, the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill will include a range of measures to support increased community ownership. Local authorities have extensive powers already to compulsory purchase land in the public interest, but as part of our Town Centre's action plan, we will continue to encourage local authorities to use compulsory purchase powers to bring neglected or abandoned land back into productive use. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? Um, First Minister, we debated the issue of town centres last week, um, and in order to address that challenge, there are key issues of funding and powers that local authorities need to be able to bring about that transformation. Will he commit to examine the powers in the Community Empowerment and Renewal Bill to ensure that local authorities actually do have the power to compulsorily purchase land to transform our town centres, particularly in those communities where market forces have failed? First Minister. Yeah, uh, indeed, that, that is what the consultation on, uh, on the bill is about, uh, and that is what the proposal is about. And we look forward to, to Sarah Boyack's uh, uh, information and her participation in that process. That is what the consultation on the bill is about, and that is what our objective is. As she knows, uh, we have uh, a commission reporting in terms of uh, land ownership in Scotland in the, the, at the present moment. I think also we need to remember the practicalities of this. Uh, when we came to office, as you'll remember, uh, we found that the land fund uh, had been scrapped by the Labour Party in 2005 and transferred responsibility to the big lottery's growing community assets. However, we then found that the big lottery fund couldn't be used to buy out 
uh, public land. Uh, so we didn't have, we had perhaps the enthusiasm to do it, but we didn't have any means to support communities exercising and buy it. If luckily, of course, this administration restored the land fund, and as a result, we're seeing once again uh, the flow of, uh, uh, the flow of uh, purchases back into community ownership going towards that uh, million acre target. So what I say to Sarah Boyack, yes, we'll look at the legislation, We'll look at the bill in terms of the consultation to see if the powers are there, but it also requires the commitment from government to put the money up uh, to make sure uh, that communities are in a position to take land into community ownership. Question six, Fiona McLeod. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of recent reports on how the UK Government's economic strategy is impacting on inequality in Scotland. First Minister. Well, the United Kingdom is one of the most unequal societies in the world. It's ranked 28th out of 34 OECD nations for income inequalities. That trend is intensifying under the Tory Liberal Government, which has delivered a double-dip recession, taking grossly unfair decisions such as removing disability living allowance from some of our most vulnerable uh, citizens. Uh, I, I think the Stirling University report is extremely welcome because it makes clear that the powers currently available to the Scottish Government are not enough to substantially reduce inequality. And that's why many of us believe a growing number believe that only with independence would Scotland have the control and the full range of policy levers necessary to tackle inequality in our country. Fiona MacLeod. I'm sure the First Minister will be aware that this week Professor Tony Travers of London School of Economics said in the Financial Times that London, and I quote, is the dark star of the economy. This following similar comments from the UK Business Secretary, Vince Cable, so does the First Minister agree with me that independence, as he talked about, is the only way that will allow us to rebalance the economy to achieve a fairer country? First Minister. Well, I, I do think uh, what uh, the Secretary of State, Vince Cable, had to say uh, should be of some uh, importance, some importance to the Liberal Democrats, since he is a Liberal Democrat, some importance to the Tories because he's in coalition uh, with the Conservatives at the present moment, uh, and some importance uh, to Joanne Lamont, who I think uh, in a speech last night seemed to think the reverse was the true. You know, I think if uh, Vince Cable and indeed Tony Travers of the LSE point to the difficulties uh, in terms of the gravitational pull that London exercise in the UK economy, uh, then I think people in the Scottish Parliament uh, should, uh, uh, should pay some attention uh, to, to the views of the, the, these people. I, I think she, Vera McLeod is absolutely correct. One of the great arguments for independence for Scotland is to get the levers, both economic, fiscal and indeed in terms of social security, required uh, to ensure that we don't have 100,000 additional children placed back into family and child poverty, as is estimated by the third sector in Scotland. That is one of the key ambitions of this country. I can see it gathers no support from the Tory benches, but it will gather support from the people of Scotland. Jackie Bailey. For those who actually take the time to read the report published by Stirling University this week, they will see that it completely undermines the SNP argument that leaving the UK would automatically reduce inequality. After all, the Institute for Fiscal Studies makes clear that a separate Scotland would need to make spending cuts twice as deep as the rest of the UK. First Minister, isn't it the case that it is the poorest and pensioners in our country who would be hardest hit by the SNP's plans for an independent First Minister. Well, only Jackie Bailey, when faced with the bedroom tax, when faced with the inequity being placed on Scotland by the Tory government, only Jackie Bailey would come to the conclusion that social security policy is better run from Westminster. But in terms of telling people to read the report, yes, I've read the report. And I've read... Well, I'm going to quote directly Order. from the benefit of Jackie Bailey. Quote... An independent Scotland would have access to fiscal powers with which it would influence inequality more directly than it can at the moment. A direct quotation from the report. Perhaps that's the page that Jackie Bailey skipped over in her anxiety to make her point. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move on to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.